All right then. Well, good evening, everyone. It is my great honor and pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker this evening. Not only is he a dear and close friend, he, I'm very proud to say that he is one of our rabbis at the Spanish and Portuguese Sephardi community of the United Kingdom. And he is the rabbi of what I call our crown jewel, Bevis Mark Synagogue. And as I've said to him and others, there's nobody that I know that would be better and is better to lead the synagogue than Rabbi Shalom Morris. And he has done so with such dignity and honor for, uh, for almost, it's getting close to a decade, my goodness gracious. It's a long time, Rabbi Shalom. And uh, he has led so much in the, uh, right now Bevis Marx is, is, is renovating and it is expanding in order that as many people as possible should be able to have the absolutely unique experience of seeing Bevis Marx. Bevis Marx is not only the oldest synagogue of the SP, not only the oldest synagogue in Britain, but it is the oldest continuously used synagogue in the world. And uh, from its opening of its doors over 300, and 300 years ago, it really, the doors have not closed. And even do during the pandemic, Rabbi Morris held vigil. He stood and maintained the function of the synagogue throughout. And for that, we are deeply grateful for him and for his service. But Rabbi Morris's great expertise and the, the cornerstone of his study, he's doing now a PhD in this, is the history of the Spanish and Portuguese Jews. And if you are like me at all, uh, and I speak as the senior rabbi now of the Spanish and Portuguese community, uh, for much of my life, I didn't really know much about the S&P. I didn't know it well. I didn't, I didn't have a familiarity with its illustrious history, its rich culture and, and uh, custom, and the amazing minds and hachamim that served the S&P for so long. And so I've, uh, you know, the, I feel that it is essential that the Habura should have a component of its curriculum that teaches S&P, right? That we understand who the Spanish and Portuguese were. And when we say Spanish Portuguese, as Rabbi Morris will explain, this is not just anybody who came from Spain. We're talking about people who, who for all intents and purposes, remained in the West and yet maintained their Sephardi roots in history. And so I'm not going to say more about that. That's Rabbi Morris's uh, uh, presentation. And if I understand correctly, Rav, you're going to be speaking tonight about the expulsion. Is that right? You're going back to the expulsion. So it's important for all of us to have a better sense of that, that event, that time in our history. And I don't want to take any more time from Rabbi Morris and from the beautiful gems that I know that he will give us on this. And uh, I'm very grateful to you, Rav, for contributing these, uh, this series to the Chabura, which will be a, a gem in our treasury, without question. Without further ado, I turn it over to you. Chabot. Thank you very much, Rabbi Dwak. And, uh, and thank you to, to everyone in the Chabura. Uh, for, for welcoming me. Uh, I think it, uh, <clears throat> it, it needs to be said that the Chabura is one of the most exciting things happening, you know, in the world of Jewish education. Uh, it's really kind of burst onto the scene and uh, it's a, a very exciting moment. Um, I think in the, uh, the course of, uh, shall we say, the 21st uh, century and kind of the, the, the shall we say, the, the rediscovery of, of uh, a path in Judaism following the ruptures of the 20th century. And we could, we could have a whole class on that. Uh, but I think it goes without saying that the, if we think about the, the significance of, let's say, the Holocaust, and, and, and people who study history, and, and maybe we'll just, just because we, we, we're, we live so close to that time, the reverberations of the Holocaust are, are still playing themselves out, right? The Jewish world still hasn't quite, shall we say, fully found its footing after what happened in the Holocaust and, and, the, and the expulsion of Jews from, from Arab lands, the establishment of the state of Israel, really those events of the middle of the 20th century, we're still seeing where they are going to lead uh, the Jewish world, what Jewish life is going to look like. The same thing can be said about the expulsion from Spain for about the next 150 years, 200 years. There's not a, a major kind of turning point in, in the development of Judaism 
you know, from 1492 till, you know, the, around 1700, that you can't draw a line directly back to the expulsion. Uh, it, it, it had wet shock waves that lasted for centuries. And certainly it is the precursor to the creation of what we call today of the, the Western Sephardim, but really the Sephardic diaspora to, to a large degree, right? Those Jews who originated in Spain. It wasn't the beginning of Jews leaving Spain. Harambam left in the 12th century and then named his name as, you know, Moshe has Sephardi. You know, there was the sense of Sephardic identity even outside of Spain for centuries already. But obviously the, 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 the force of the expulsion uh, sent shockwaves throughout the Jewish world. It, it very well probably was the largest Jewish community in the world um, in 1492. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it being dissolved in such a, shall we say, violent way, uh, in such a sudden way, really was a traumatic event for the Jewish world. And so what I want to do because you can't talk about anything that happens afterwards. You know, you can't talk about Tzfat and the Mekubalim, and you can't talk about what was happening, you know, in North Africa, in Italy, in Amsterdam, in London, without understanding the event that created those, those waves, those communities. Um, because it wasn't just, oh, they were from Spain and Andalusia, you know, back from the 11th century. It really were the, the trauma of, shall we say, 1492 to just choose one significant year in that traumatic episode um, that, that, that colors how different things develop, how communities develop, the challenges that they face, and the different courses that they set afterwards. So there's Again, tons of things you can talk about related to the expulsion, because again, it, it, it spreads throughout the Mediterranean. Um, but what I wanna do in this series is really go back to the beginning, to go back to 1492 and to simply ask the question, what happened? What happened? It seems like a simple question, uh, but it is a complicated question to answer, because it's not simply, oh, the Jews were expelled. Uh, why Jews were expelled, in what way they were expelled, uh, what were the, the, the immediate implications, all of those things are, shall we say, contested uh, among, uh, among scholars. And you'll see why, because the literature of that era is uh, difficult to pull apart or there's clearly a number of things that are taking place. Now, when we think of Jewish history, you know, people kind of go through and talk about, you know, all the people that tried to destroy us, you know, and we survived and, you know, so they say, oh, you know, it was the Egyptians and the Babylonians and the Romans, you know, and the Spanish and then the Nazis. And you go to Spain, Spain, it was, a, like I said, a hugely traumatic event, but, it's, it's not the same as those, other, as those other events. And it really needs to be understood for what it was. So just for one example, just to give a sense of the fact that on some level, while we kind of think of it historically as like one of these, you know, unique events that occurred and something that was just like almost like watershed because it was watershed in some ways, but we think of it as like this like standalone event is not really true. I'm gonna share my, um, my uh, screen with you to start to just look at a few different things uh, together. So here I'm just showing with you a uh, half of a map, and this is Western Europe. So obviously you have Spain expulsion in 1492, and you have the expulsion then from Portugal in 1497. Next week we're gonna talk about Portugal. So Portugal is very similar, but entirely different. Uh, than what happens in Spain. And it's crucial to understand what happened in Portugal, to understand the history of what we call the Western Sephardim or the, the SNP, the Spanish and Portuguese. But if you look above that, you see that Jews were expelled from England in 1290. They were expelled from France. Well, it says 1306. They were expelled several times because they kept getting invited back throughout the 14th century, but finally expelled in 1396. 
And then in 1492, Spain. So when you think about, so particularly, basically by the end of the 15th century, by the year 1500, there are no, what I guess I would say are, are Jews or at least open Jews living in Western Europe. But Spain was, was basically the last, the last of it, meaning there were countries expelling Jews already for 200 years before they were expelled from Spain. And then at the very end of that, the last, you know, shall we say domino to fall is Spain and Portugal. So it starts to give you a little bit of a sense, right? We think of Spain as like, you know, you know the anti-Semitic anti and evil and they, and they hated the Jews. Well, they held out a lot longer than the other countries did, right? A lot of these other countries, you know, good old England, right? Expelled Jews in 1290, 200 years before. So the question really is to understand what was going on in Spain, what led to the expulsion. So we're going to look at a few key sources in order to understand this. Some of them are, uh, shall we say, secular sources, and some of them will look at sources from Torah uh, to understand the perspective of what was happening from the Spanish side of things, and to look at the perspective of what was happening from the Jewish side of things as well. And it's messy. I'll just I'll start with that. It's a messy. Uh, it's a messy story. In order to start, I want to begin with how it ends, okay? It ends in 1492 with the expulsion. So let's just take a look at what the edict of expulsion actually says, because the king and queen didn't simply say, the Jews are expelled, get out. They wrote a Megillah, if I could say that. They wrote a Megillah, basically outlining why it is and what, under what conditions the Jews have been expelled from their dominion. And so I've pulled out a few key uh, paragraphs from that edict of expulsion for us to look at and to try to unpack to understand what actually uh, had taken place, or at least one view of what had taken place. Now, it's perfect timing for us to actually look at the edict of expulsion because it was issued on the 31st of March, 1492. And then it went into effect the 31st of July, 1492. So where we find ourselves right now is during those months when the Jewish community was in complete panic mode um, because the Edict of Expulsion had been issued and they were told they had four months to settle their affairs and to get out of the country on pain of death. Uh, and so it's really Ben Hamid Sarim. I mean, it really was a difficult time. And obviously there, there's uh, this idea that, you know, the, the, the expulsion went into effect on Tisha B'Av. It may not be the exact day, but right around that day is when, it went, uh, is when it went into effect. So what I'd like to do is to take a look at the edict that would have been issued in 1492, just last week, uh, and, and see what it says there. And I think it may be for some of us, surprising because there's a lot of things that people say about the expulsion that muddles a lot of things together and there's a lot of confusion about what actually had transpired. So let's take a look out. This is not the full edict. This is a, uh, like I said, just a selection uh, of the sources. So I'm just going to start reading it to you. Please feel free to read along, you know, to follow along with me uh, as I go. It says, you know well or ought to know that whereas we have been informed that in these our kingdoms, there were some wicked Christians who Judaized, meaning who were performing Jewish rituals and apostatized, meaning they even left the Catholic faith from our holy Catholic faith, right? And became Jews. The great cause of which, right? Why is it? They're describing a phenomenon that there are Christians who are observing Judaism. So what, basically they're trying to say, well, why is this happening, right? Crazy story. There's Christians who are living as Jews. So what's going on? Why are the Christians living as Jews? So it says, the great cause of which was their interaction between Jews and these Christians. So they're saying because Jews are hanging out with these Christians and they are influencing these Christians to live as Jews. Now it continues. It says, in the courts which we held in the city of Toledo, in the 
past year of 1,480, so in the year 1480, we ordered the separation of the said Jews in all cities, towns, and villages of our kingdoms and lordships, and commanded that they be given Jewish quarters and separated places where they should live, hoping that by their separation, the situation would remedy itself. So they're writing in 1492, and they're saying in 1480, 12 years ago, we ordered that Jews should all live, right, in Jewish quarters, that they should not have any interaction with other Christians, so that Jews will stop influencing Christians to live as Jews. However, as we'll see, it didn't, in their eyes, work. It didn't work. The influencing continued. Furthermore, it says, what else did they do? Meaning, they're saying, even before we got to this expulsion, these are the steps we already had taken. So one thing, we separated the Jews from the non-Jews. Two, what else did they do? They said, furthermore, we procured and gave orders that, the, that an inquisition should be made in our aforementioned kingdoms and lordships, which, as you know, has for 12 years been made and is being made, and by many guilty persons have been discovered, as is very well known. I'll explain what he's saying in a second. And the court, right? So he says, we also 12 years ago, the year is 1481, they established an inquisition. So by the way, expulsion and inquisition are two different things, right? So people often conflate the two. They're not the same. The expulsion is 1492. Inquisition was established in 1481. And they said the inquisition, whose job it is, is to discover are there Christians who are secretly practicing Judaism, right? And they say that the Inquisition has turned up, that it can persist, that there are still, even after we've separated Jews and Christians, there are still Christians that are observing Judaism. And it says, and by many guilty persons have been discovered, as is very well known. And accordingly, we are informed by the inquisitors and by other devout persons, ecclesiastical and secular, that great injury has resulted and still results since the Christians have engaged in and continue to engage in social interaction and communication. They have by means and ways that they can to subvert and to steal faithful Christians from our holy Catholic faith and to separate them from it and draw them to themselves and subvert them to their own wicked belief and conviction, right? He says, even though we've done this, we've discovered from the Inquisition that they are subversive. These Jews are still stealing, you know, good Christians and turning them into Jews, right? To draw them to themselves and subvert them back to their own wicked belief and conviction, instructing them in the ceremonies and observances of their law, holding meetings at which they read and teach that which people must hold and believe according to their law, achieving that the Christians and their children be circumcised and giving them books from which they may read their prayers and declaring to them the fasts that they must keep, right? All these things that they're teaching these Christians to do and joining with them to read and teach them the history of their law, indicating to them the festivals before they occur. So telling them, hey guys, next week is Passover, right? Advising them on what in them they are to hold and observe, carrying to them and giving to them from their houses unleavened bread and meats ritually slaughtered, right? So these people can't just go to the market and buy kosher food, but the Jews are bringing them the kosher meat, right? And speak, I'll explain more in a moment, instructing them about the timings from which they, the things from which they must refrain as much in eating as in other things in order to observe their law and persuading them as much as they can to hold and observe the law of Moses, right? Torah to Moshe, convincing them that there is no other law or truth except for that one. This proved by many statements and confessions, both from these same Jews and from those who have been perverted and enticed by them, which has redounded to the great injury, detriment, and opprobrium of our holy Catholic faith. Mouthful. They lay out an indictment of the Jews in Spain that they are encouraging and facilitating the observance of Judaism from Christians, which one of the, shall we say, the, the underlying principle of this is that from their perspective, if a Christian observes 
Judaism, that is heretical, right? That's them being apostates, right? They are not observing the ways of Christianity, but they are observing the ways of Judaism. Now, from this, it's clear that they, so let me ask you, do they have a problem with Judaism, right? Meaning from this, what does this document say to you? I'm curious if you have any, any reactions to this. What, what, is there anything you can kind of like start pulling out of this, uh, out of this document that maybe would be surprising to you? If anybody has any thought, I'm not sure if you guys are able to, to talk or not without we, uh, enabling you, but if you can, Tell me, what, what, are you, what are you maybe surprised by what you've seen in here? May I make a comment? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. So my name is Daniel. Um, I would like to suggest that these Christians are actually Jews, not Christians, but in order to get, gain any social advantage, they probably converted just officially to Christianity, but really wanted to stay Jews. Great. So first of all, Daniel, thank you. That is a thousand percent correct. Now we're gonna unpack who were these Christians who were actually Jews. So first of all, that is correct. We are not talking about Jews just going and being missionaries and trying to convince Christians to convert to Judaism. We're talking about Jews influencing former Jews, if we could call them that, we'll talk about that, um, to, to continue to observe Judaism. I, what we'll see is from the Christian perspective, whether or not they used to be Jews is irrelevant. Now they are Christians, they were baptized, and therefore they are, it's as, it's as heretical for them to observe Judaism as it would be for any other Christian to observe Judaism too. Thank you, Dana. Okay, anybody else? What else is, are people maybe uh, seeing in this? They might be surprised. Uh, I have an, uh, I want to give an opinion. My name is Abraham. Hi, Abraham. Uh, so basically, I, I I I saw a well a video from a Spanish guy who he's an historian and he was mentioning exactly what you are saying that basically this situation wasn't about antisemitism, but it was about the the Catholic Church trying to create an identity, and for them the issue was not about Jews, Jews and Catholics. It was about trying to impose the Catholic religion to everyone. So uh, the expulsion was um, because for them, it was a problem having Jews still being Jews in the, you know, uh, uh, what, how can I say that? So Abraham, I think what you're saying is interesting because that's actually not what the document says to me. At least what I see in this document is that they don't have a problem with Jews being Jews. They have a problem oh, yes. with Christians being Jews. Yes, sorry, and that's, that's, and what, that's the and what they're arguing, what they're arguing is that while you have Jews present, you have Christians who are not living good Christian lives. And so for the sake of the Christians, the Jews have to go, but not that they inherently had a problem with Jews living as Jews in Spain. Yeah, sorry, that, that's what, I, what this guy was trying to say, saying that, right, right. that, that uh, even in Spain, some people and, and proper historians know that the issue wasn't with the Jews. It was with, with the people still practicing other religion and not being proper Catholics. That, that, okay, was the, right. that was the main issue. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Abraham. So that's certainly what this document says. Now, some people will counter, you cannot take the word of, you know, your persecutor. And just because that's what they write in this document does not necessarily mean what that was really motivating them. And it could be what was motivating them was a hatred of Jews and Judaism, right? But they couched it in, in this, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, noble language. So that's debatable, but certainly from this document, it seems that they were, they had a sincere concern, uh, as it were. Take it or leave it, whether you, whether you, shall we say, you buy it. Um, but I think, let me see who else has, I see someone has their hand up, so please, uh, please go ahead. Um, I think, 
church was a bit insecure uh, when uh, christians started interacting with jews and uh, the catholic religion the earliest uh, uh, church uh, grew by uh, keeping uh, christians contained well contained uh, by not allowing them to look outside and uh, many of their festivals are probably related to jewish festivals by a different name and uh, when they came in contact with jews and uh, probably part of that uh, um, heritage was uh, known and uh, they understood uh, that uh, judaism was uh, more ancient than christianity and that christianity came from uh, judaism in some sense and that they wanted to avoid to uh, probably still keep uh, uh, christians contained well contained within the walls thank you thank you sivan it's interesting i i actually i it's an interesting point i actually think well perhaps one could argue that in other contexts in this context it probably doesn't seem to be the case because jews have been living with christians in spain for centuries for centuries and centuries already we think of oh the jews of spain living among the muslims but as i'll show you another map in a, in a second <laughs> most Jews have been living in among Christians for 400 years already 300 years this was nothing new there was like it wasn't like a new phenomenon that Jews and Christians are living side by side and you know for hundreds of years they weren't bothered by it so all of a sudden they're bothered by it it, it begs the question of you know like what what's happening now you know that all of a sudden that they should be uh you know should be bothered by it does anybody else have any other any other kind of um, things that they thought, thought surprising about this? So I'll tell you, I'll tell you something that that I think is surprising about this. You know, if you're, I think if we, you look back and you you know we just kind of dip into our memories of what we thought about the Spanish expulsion. You know, you think of King Ferdinand, Queen Isabella, you know, sitting there and saying, "Get rid of the Jews, expel them." This is a, is a, shall we say, an impressive document. I mean, I only pulled out a selection of it. It's a very long um, edict. You can just Google it, you'll find it online. And it's clear, and, and it's almost surprising that they are, what they're essentially doing here is what I would say is justifying the expulsion. They're justifying it. Now, does that indicate that they are just, shall we say, a legal society, and there's a process to things, and this is simply kind of the process that you do. You know, you can't just issue an edict of expulsion; you have to substantiate it, you know, in order to do it. Or, which may just be what it is; it's just kind of reflective of the the legal system in place in Spain. Or does this actually reflect? Can you tease out of here, shall we say, a reluctance to expel the Jewish community? either a reluctance because they felt that expulsions were, were a bad thing to do, or because in lots of other ways they, they liked having the Jews live there, or because they thought Jews had the right to live there. And it seems that they are going to great lengths in the edict of expulsion to justify on what basis they have chosen to expel the Jewish community, which speaks to the sense of perhaps a bit of tension around whether that was whether that should be the case, and perhaps speaks to the fact that this was not something that was uh, embraced by everybody. I mean, it's interesting, Abravanel, who lived in Spain at the time of the expulsion, he writes that, uh, he says it was, it was the queen, not the king. <laughs> he says, the ki you know, the king was not so, so, so into it, but the queen uh, wanted to, and so he acquiesced. I don't know if that's true or not, but, but it, it, it perhaps reflects at the very least I mean, Ravana would have known, but perhaps at the very least, it reflects the fact that there, this was not some simple thing. I mean, like I said, the Jewish community in Spain was massive. Now, there's different views about how large the community was. You know, was it 300,000 people? Was it 100,000? Was it 50? I mean, numbers back then were smaller than they are now. It's not millions the way we think of populations. You know, population booms happen afterwards. You know, this is still kind of the end of the medieval times. So population is not massive. So for but for Jewish world, it was those were massive numbers, um, and so you get the sense that there is a, a bit of tension around 
around this expulsion. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things going on in this document. And obviously what it, what it says to us, is we have to understand really what's happening uh, at this time. But we'll just skip to the last paragraph that I pulled out over here, um, where they kind of say their conclusion, though well, there's more of the document afterwards, where they say, therefore, because essentially all of this has failed, you know, Jews are still influencing Christians. Therefore, we, with the council and vice of the prelates, great noblemen of our kingdoms, and other persons of learning and wisdom of our council, having taken deliberation about this matter, resolve to order the said Jews and Jewesses of our kingdom to depart and never to return or come back again. It's quite emphatic. Um, it's powerful. I mean, you, you must feel the, you know, you know, 800 years, a thousand years of Jewish history, you know, in a moment snuffed out, you know, never to return or come back again. It's not true, <laughs> Jews have come back, but, uh, but at that point, so it really was a, uh, a very difficult, um, a very difficult moment. Um, and as we say with, uh, you know, Abravanel tried to argue, apparently the Jewish community tried to offer a bribe to have it rescinded. It all failed. They were committed to the expulsion and uh, the expulsion order was, you know, did go into effect on the 31st of July. 1492. So the question is, what's actually happening over here? Like, why in 1492 is this happening? As we said, there's been Jews and Christians living together there for, for centuries. Other countries have expelled Jews for a while already. Why else in 1492 is there this decision to, uh, to expel the Jewish community? So I want to start by looking at a map with you, and we'll kind of start talking about the events that occurred. But what I have over here is just a, a small... Uh, map um, showing what's known as the Reconquista um, of Spain. So the Reconquista is, is, is the term that's used for the reconquest of Spain. What does it mean the reconquest? Well, we know that in the eighth century, right, Arabs uh, conquered uh, Spain from the Christian kings that had been there, the Visigoths, right, who had been there beforehand and essentially conquered the entire Iberian Peninsula up to what we think of as France. And then, you know, almost immediately from the time that that happened, there were Christian kings trying to recapture land from, from, these, from this Muslim caliphate that was established. And it's a long history, it's, it's, it's centuries of, of, of conflict. And what this shows is that little by little, century by century, more and more of the Iberian Peninsula came under control of Christian kings again. Uh, and if you make your way down, right, basically until 1210, you have the north half of the country in Christian rule, the southern half in Muslim rule. But then in 1210, right, you finally have essentially the reconquest of almost the entire Iberian Peninsula. Um, so that basically by the year 1200, essentially, all of Spain has been reconquered by Christians. Only in Granada, the very bottom tip, is there still a, uh, a Muslim uh, ruler, but otherwise it's under Christian rule. Uh, so that means that the Jews who are living in Toledo, in Sevilla, in Cordoba, certainly in Barcelona, right? They're living under Christian rule. They're living. They're living with uh, living with Christians. It's a fascinating. Uh, we could have a whole class about those centuries um, and, and and all the things that happened. I mean, the the Kabbalah was written during that time. Uh, there's lots to uh, there's lots to to unpack about that. But essentially, Spain had been reconquered. But finally, in 1492, the reconquest, shall we say, was completed. Finally, in 1492, they captured Granada. And in fact, the, the edict of expulsion is known as the Alhambra Decree because they issued it from the Alhambra, right, in Granada, right? They had gone there. They were then sitting as king and queen in Granada, in the Alhambra, right, the amazing palace that's there. And that's where they issued the edict of expulsion. So it does seem like it kind of came at this moment where, you know, for a long time, they were having conflict between the Jews and the Muslims. They finally ended that conflict and then kind of looked back and said, we just fought this whole war with the Muslims and we still have Jews here. So maybe we should cleanse Spain of, of Jews as well. 
right? And so there may be that element to it again. That's not really what the document says, but there may be an element to that, that there was this sense of like nationalism, the sense of purity uh, that came along that said, you know, now we can make a pure Christian nation and Jews really just don't fit into that. If you take that view, then basically you look at everything that's written in the Edict of Expulsion and say that was just a, uh, a justification for them doing what they actually want to do, which was just to get rid of Jews. But the, it does talk about this thing happening between Jews and Christians. So the question is, what really is happening between the Jews and the Christians uh, in Spain? And really to understand that, you have to go to 1391. So I mentioned that there had been an expulsion from England in 1290 and then from France in the 14th century, and then eventually in, in, in Spain at the, at the end of the 15th century. So what's happening? Like what's going on in Western Europe? They are one by one expelling you know, Jews from their countries. So there's been a bit of a, uh, shall we say, development, a religious development in Western Europe uh, during the 13th and 14th centuries of the, what they call the mendicant orders, which are these, you know, orders that the Franciscans and the Dominicans who are meant to kind of uh, live in poverty and to, uh, and to self-flagellation, right? To like really like in order to, to win the, the sympathy of God, to live these very, shall we say, humble, you know, experiences, to suffer, you know, as, 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 uh, as, as, you know, as Jesus had done, and to basically live these very, like, religiously intense lives. And there is a growing movement of following these orders, and it seems that that influence was kind of slowly making its way down through Western Europe and starting to really uh, captivate, you know, more and more Christian people to that kind of brand of Christianity. Now, you have to appreciate that these are difficult centuries because this is the time of the Black Death. The famously, the Black Death is 1348, but really throughout the 1200s and 1300s, there are spikes in Black Death happening. So there's lots of death around, lots of fear. And obviously in those moments, people try to say you know, these punishments from God and so forth. And so it's, it's led to this kind of religious fervor. And what happens in 1391, there is a, uh, an archdeacon uh, who preaches, he's, he's been preaching, and he preaches in Seville, against the Jews, and it ignites a spark. It ignites a spark where there ends up being this popular uprising against Jews in Seville. There's some numbers that say maybe 4,000 Jews were killed there, and it then spreads throughout all of Spain, right? Even making it up to Northern Spain as well. And what that leads to is many Jews being murdered, and many Jews being forcibly converted uh, to Catholicism. And it leads to a reality where you have still some Jews living in Spain who were never converted. They, they had kind of uh, survived you know, the, the, the uprising and were still Jews and they continued to practice as Jews. But you then had a very large population of converted Jews who, from Christianity's perspective, though it could be debated in Christian theology because it was done under duress, but <laughs> practically they said it doesn't matter what under what the conditions were, you, you, you elected, you chose to convert. And therefore, from Christianity's perspective in Spain, they were now Christians. And so from their view, they were now obligated to live good Christian lives. But you obviously have to appreciate <laughs> these people didn't want to be Christians. They were forcibly converted. You know, they, they either were forcibly converted or they did it to save their lives. You know, probably different situations happened in different places. But essentially, you know, they, they wanted to be Jews. They still wanted to keep Shabbat. They still wanted to keep Pesach. They still wanted to, you know, pray three times a day. And so they ended up being stuck. So from a Christian perspective, observing Judaism, 
for a Christian was illegal. For a Jew, perfectly, perfectly fine. Maybe they think it's mistaken, but, per, but, but perfectly legal to do that. And so any Christian caught practicing Judaism was breaking the law. And if they were caught, they could be prosecuted, you know, for, for doing that. There were different punishments for people who would have been, uh, shall we say, practicing heresy from a Christian, from a Christian view. And, but obviously there was this problem that, you know, it was like, it could be people living in the same house. You know, it could be one person in the house was converted, one person wasn't, or your, your uncle was converted, but your other uncle wasn't, or your neighbor was converted and you weren't, and you're all still living in the, in the Jewish neighborhood, you know, and, you know, when it's Pesach time, you've, you've made matzot and you pass the matzah through the window to the next guy, you know, like, these are Jewish neighborhoods, right? Jews live in the same neighborhoods. So Jews are, and the, and the what we'll call the new Christians, conversos, are living together, sometimes the same families. And so obviously that lends itself to some of them maintaining some semblance of Jewish practice, even if they couldn't do so openly. Now things basically become very complicated because from a Christian perspective, to just add another level to this, the dream has always been that the Jews will convert to Christianity, right? That's like, you think of missionaries, like that's their goal, convert Jews to Christianity. The problem is, is, or the, is that it's, that's very easy when it's like two or three Jews that convert because they just mix into the dominant culture. But if you all of a sudden convert in mass tens of thousands of Jewish people, maybe even more of them, maybe 100,000 of them, I mean, the numbers are hard to, to, to know from that time, then you end up with a situation where you all of a sudden have all of these people who as Christians can now don't have any limitations, right? As Jews, maybe there were certain professions they couldn't be. And now all of a sudden, now that they're Christians, they can do those professions. And there's a lot of them. And maybe they monopolize an industry, or maybe they even become priests. And so, so now the priests are these people. And so there's a great, there's a growing frustration in Spanish society where they don't see these new Christians as real Christians. And they have a lot of animosity and jealousy towards these new Christians, where they feel that A, they're not real Christians, and they're taking our jobs away. And maybe on top of that, they're not even really practicing Christianity properly, and yet they're still getting the benefits and rights of living as Christians. It caused huge social um, friction. In fact, in Seville, sorry, in Toledo, in 1449, they actually issued a law called the Limpiza de Sangre, which means the purity of blood laws, that started making a rule, really against Christi Christian rule, but nonetheless, they made it anyway, that said that certain professions you could only enter into if you were had purity of blood, meaning you were from what was known as an old Christian family. Well, you, if you are from a new Christian family, even though you're a Christian, you don't have purity of blood and therefore you can't enter those professions. So what they essentially started doing was putting barriers between Christians. It, this caused huge, huge societal problems in Spain. And these are problems that will last lasted for centuries in Spain. Again, if, if we do another series in the future, I can talk about kind of what happens in Spain, you know, in the centuries to follow with all of these new Christians, but it's very messy. It's a very complicated situation. And basically, to some extent, they are trying to untangle this mess that they created. Um, and one of the ways to do that is a belief that the only reason that these new Christians are continuing to live these, shall we say, double lives is because there are Jews living there. They even tried putting the Jews into ghettos, right? For lack of a better term, to the Guderias, right? Into, into separate areas and to make all new Christians live in other areas. But that didn't work because they still it's, it's your cousin, it's your brother, you know, you're still, you're still, uh, there's still these interactions. And so basically they realized that the only way to get the new Christians 
shall, to, shall we say, fully assimilate into, uh, into Christian society would be to get rid of the Jews. Now, just parenthetically, we don't have time to really go into it deeply. In 1481, they established an inquisition. The role of the inquisition is basically, as I said, if a Christian is observing Judaism, that's against the law. But it's not like they had like a police force that was like looking into it. It was like, if they found out, they would prosecute it. They established an inquisition to essentially be that their job is to root out any Christians who are observing Judaism, right? Any new Christians observing Judaism. And that is the, that's from this Tomas de Torquemada, right? Who is that, who, who's the head of the, the inquisition. And it becomes the job of the inquisition to search out this heresy, right? From a Christian perspective and to figure out what's really going on. Um, and obviously what they discover is that it is, it is going on. Now, again, there are debates about whether when, when inquisitors claim that somebody is observing Judaism, is it true they really are? Or are they just doing trumped up charges so that they can take all of their money? It's a whole debate uh, in, in the scholarship around that. But let's just for now take it as its word that they actually are discovering secret Jewish practices. It's not surprising. And that kind of creates the basis for them to say, we're now going to expel, uh, to expel the Jewish community. It's a mess. It's a mess. It'll be a, a mess for Spain because then Spain will have an inquisition that will last for centuries. What will basically happen is the inquisition will then not only look at people practicing Judaism, they'll say, are they practicing heretical versions of Christianity? You know, are they reading uh, works about Protestantism? Are they, are there witches practicing? It, it becomes a huge, huge mess in Spain. And again, that's for a whole other, we do a whole class about the Inquisition and how it worked and, and, and what really happened with it. And, and, and was it legitimate? Meaning were they finding Judaism? Weren't they? Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit next week when we talk about Portugal, because as I said, Portugal is similar, but different to what happens uh, to what happens in Spain. What I will say, is that it seems to work. It seems to work. We know from the documents of the Inquisition that there are records of the Inquisition discovering Christians practicing Judaism that go until about 1515. After 1515, you don't really find in the Spanish Inquisition documents until later, we can talk about why that is, um, any, any, shall we say, cases or large numbers of cases of secret Jewish practice. So it does seem that once the open Jews left, any of the new Christians that remained behind without, you know, the support and benefit of, of open Jews living close by, eventually just kind of assimilate into Christian society, stop, you know, being able to observe Jewish practice and essentially, um, you know, assimilate into, into the dominant Christian culture. Now, that is not the end of the story. We, there's the whole phenomenon of banana seam and things like that. And maybe next week we'll, we'll talk about that when we talk about Portugal. But essentially in Spain, it, it seems to work. It seems to work. The Inquisition, they, they expel the open Jews, they have an Inquisition, and it roots out uh, any remaining vestiges of Judaism. And that's the end of Judaism in Spain. Uh, what I'm going to just look at for a few minutes with you is, you know, that's all from the Christian perspective. But from the Jewish perspective, what was happening? What was going on? Meaning, what were Jews thinking throughout the 1400s about all of these Jews who had converted to Christianity and were now living these double lives? So the sources I have over here are from Chachamim who lived in North Africa some of whom their families had come from Spain and are writing about these people because it raises all kinds of halachic questions about how do you relate to a person who lived, was a Jew, was converted to Christianity, now lives at least to some degree as a Christian, and what if they touch your bottle of wine? Is your wine still kasher or is it not kasher? Can they give a dut in a bet din? They're maybe technically Jews, but they live as Christians. 
They're going to go to Bet Din and offer testimony. Is that testimony valid? All kinds of questions start arising. And one of the basis of these questions is you see what I would say is a growing uh, disdain for the new Christians. So I'll just start over here and look at what the Rivash says. And just read the beginning of what he says over here. He says, he goes, this is source one. He says, He says, even though the beginning of this was against their will, he says, nowadays, he's now transgressing willingly. Why? Because some of these people, even when they're in their own homes, are not observing Torah. So if they were only breaking Torah in public because they had no choice, that's one thing. But if now even in their homes, they're breaking Torah, that's it. You know, at this point, we don't consider them to be anusim if they are willingly going to be observing uh, Christianity or not observing Torah uh, in that, uh, even in private. You go on, these basically go from generation after generation. If you look at source number two, uh, the Tashbets, he quotes from Rambam, and he refers to these Anusim, right? So this is now the next generation, because he says he has a problem. He says the problem with these people is that, well, they could have left, right? Meaning like some Jews after 1391, some of these converted ones escape Spain and go to North Africa where they can return to live as Jews. So they say, well, you stayed in Spain. You could have left. So are you really an ones if you could escape, even if it would be very difficult to escape to another place where you could live as a Jew? Meaning, yes, in Spain, you're an ones. But if you could leave and not be an ones, maybe you don't have the status of ones while remaining in Spain. And he quotes the Rambam about uh, people who are apostates. Uh, he says it over here down below. And he refers to them. He says, uh, he goes, it's like a dog that returns to eat his own vomit, right? He says, like, if you could leave and you don't, <laughs> it's disgusting. So you see there's like this growing disdain and, shall we say, frustration. Again, the Jews in Spain probably can't write these things because if they are seen to be aiding and abetting new Christians... Or, 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 or somehow besmirching them, they could get in trouble. But these Jews live in North Africa now, so they can write what they want. And they're not very pleased. They're not happy with what they, with what they see. What's interesting is as you go further, you know, you can see the, the, the decades following as we go through these sources, right, is that, you know, this last one, it says, it says, Mase shahaya kachaya sheyesh tishim shanaviyote, right? He's saying it's 90 years since the forced conversions. And then he describes the reality that now we're talking about the third or fourth generation. So he says, on some level, you can't blame those people anymore, right? If it's the grandchildren or great-grandchildren of the people who originally were forcibly converted, you can't have the same disdain for them that, oh, if they want to be Jews, they should have left. Why aren't they leaving? He says, it's complicated. They, they grew up that way. You know, they're at this point kind of tinok shenishba. So he says, these people, we should reach out to, we should encourage them to return to Torah. You know, and they say that, we know that new Christians typically only marry other new Christians. So even though they're living as Christians, they're still halakhically Jews because they're only marrying amongst themselves. And it says we should encourage them to come back. So you see over the century, there's like this changing attitude between you know, those who originally convert and their children and then the later generations. But basically it's a mess. It's a very difficult situation. At the end of the story, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jewish lives were destroyed, either because of forced conversions or because they were murdered or, or because they, they were expelled and had to flee. And uh, it's a very sad uh, ending, you know, to what was an illustrious history of Jews, uh, to Jews in Spain. Um, but what I want, really want to pull out from here is that it's a very complicated, it's a very complicated uh, story that's happening over there. And what I'm actually really interested in is, is going to be the next class where we talk about Portugal, because really the story doesn't end with Spain. The story continues in Portugal. And, and that's really where the story continues well beyond 1492. 
And, and we need to unpack that and understand that to ultimately understand the Western Sephardim, the, the kilot that are established in Italy and in Amsterdam and London, that's gonna be about Portugal. So, so definitely come tune back in for that. I, I, I noticed that lots of people have been commenting in the chat. I haven't looked at any of them because I've just been teaching, um, but maybe I'll lead it to uh, the organizer of If there are any questions that you wanna ask me, um, I'm happy to, to answer them. Or if you want, I can just look through the chat myself. I'll take direction from you. Uh, wow, thank you so much for that in insightful presentation. Um, so I think if anyone has uh, questions, they can uh, raise their hand and we can take that. And maybe in the meantime, Zohachan, if you want, you can go through the chat as well, whatever, however way you want to take it on. Okay, so let me see. Let me see uh, if there's any um, questions in here that uh, are helpful for me to, to answer. Um, yeah, the statistics are, like I said, are very difficult to know. Is it a third of the Jews that were forcibly converted? A half of them, some were killed, some were converted. It's hard to know. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's enough that it rocked Spanish society. So it, it's quite significant, uh, significant uh, story over here. Um, let's see. Um, I'm just going through. A lot of people kind of posted comments. Uh, so I'm not going to comment on people's comments. It was more I'm going to I'll address if anybody has any um, specific questions um, that they wanted uh, me to uh, to answer. Um, actually, it's not mostly questions. It's mostly just people making their own comments. So if anybody wants to look at their comments, you're welcome to. If anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to um, to, to to answer them. What I will say, I'll, I'll say that this is, this is a bit of a tricky one. In, in, in the popular Jewish mind, they say, you know, the, the Jews of Ashkenaz were martyrs and, and the Sephardim were, were uh, you know, were, were apostates. And uh, I'll just say it's, 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 it's a very unfair comparison for lots of different reasons. Not to mention many of the Jews of Spain were killed and there were plenty of Ashkenazim that unfortunately were, did convert to Christianity too. So if anybody ever tells you that and says, you know, like, oh, in the Crusades, all the Ashkenazim, you know, died al Kiddush Hashem and the Sephardim didn't, it's not true. It, there's, it's, it's, it's an unfair, and there's been academic articles that have been uh, written about. I, mean, I can talk about it more if anyone's interested, but uh, I just thought I would put that out there. Okay. Does anybody any, have any questions? Any questions? Um, okay, I, th I think that was very clear. Everyone, no one has questions. Um, okay, so thank you so much, Rob, for that very insightful presentation. We're very excited to have you on next week for the second part of the series about Portugal, um, I believe on Monday. Um, so everyone uh, make sure to, to, to join that as well for the continuation and um, continue uh, following along for all the other awesome content we have. Um, also just uh, sharing that the Chaburah's uh, publishing house came out with their first book on Pesach, so make sure to get that before the Moed. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for coming, everyone. And uh, Chacham, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank, thank you, you all much. so much for having me. Wonderful, wonderful to study with you. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Have a wonderful night.